Hey. Hello. Good morning, Laura. Good morning, Pam. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Thank you for having us. Um, unfortunately, Alitza Shepard couldn't make it today. Um, it's okay. But the we have are... lots to show you. You guys are here in force. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you an introduction. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Elaine Wang, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, I need to drink some water. Elaine Wang is an architect with the Van Meter Williams Pollock, currently working on four all electric buildings in the Bay Area. She is also an affordable housing advocate and serves on the board of the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Laura Shagalov is a partner and architect at Van Meter's William Pollock and leads the Minneapolis office, which opened in 2019. She is leading several all electric affordable housing projects in California and is a certified passive house consultant. Pam Good is an associate and serves as project architect at Van, Van Meter Williams Pollock, working on affordable housing developments. Over the last 25 years, she has focused her attention on sustainable building practices, starting with natural building and straw bale construction in the mid 90s. She co-leads the sustainability committee at Van Meter Williams Pollock with Michael Clefhorn. Uh, Clef Horn. <laughs> Welcome. So um, can you share your, uh, your side screen? Get that tested out. Excellent. Perfect. Can you can you see that? Everything is Good? full okay. screen. And I will Great. mute myself. Welcome. Thank you so much, the three of you. Yes. Take it away, Laura. All right. Um, thank you so much for having us, Sean. And it's just, I loved your presentation. It's very exciting to be here with everyone and learn from you all too. Uh, we are architects and we're going to talk about a couple case studies of all electric housing, um, all of it affordable, most of it mid-rise and in the Bay Area. Um, go ahead, Elaine. Um, we're going to just take a minute to introduce BMWP. We have three offices. San Francisco is our largest and our home base. Um, Denver and Minneapolis. We also have two smaller offices in those locations. And we are an architecture and an urban design firm. Both disciplines inform our practice. On the architecture side, we work with a lot of amazing nonprofit developers. And much of what we do is affordable housing. And we also do a lot of adaptive reuse and any other projects that you know fulfill our goals in the urban design world as well. So infill, mixed use, housing around um, transit. And then on the urban design side, um, we do a lot of physical form-based planning, um, master planning, small area plans, down to development feasibility. And so we very much think about the larger community context when we're designing on the architecture front. Uh, sustainability is a pretty central focus of ours in the office. Uh, um, as Sean mentioned, Pam uh, co-leads our sustainability committee in the office. We are a AAA 2030 challenge signatory. Um, and we have a variety of projects going through a variety of certification systems. Right now we have 13 all electric buildings in the hopper, which is really exciting. Um, and so we're just going to pull out three as snapshots of different typologies to share with you um, as we go through here. And then uh, this is just our office. We work with an amazingly uh, fun and engaged group of people. We do a lot together inside the office, like the design charrettes outside the office tours, uh, construction tours, community events, all kinds of stuff. So um, that's us. And Elaine is going to take us through the first case study. Great. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, um, Sean, for the invitation. It's good to be here. Um, this is one of the projects that we're collaborating wonderfully with Redwood Energy on. Um, this is 231 Grant, uh, which is uh, an educator housing project on Santa Clara County land. Um, in the city of Palo Alto. And um, here we're, um, just to go through the stats briefly, um, we're uh, working on this with Mercy Housing and Abode Communities. They're the, the lead developers. Mercy Housing is a national firm um, and Abode Communities has primarily been focused in LA, but they are, have a focus on educator housing, um, especially down in the, in the Southern California area. We've got 110 units. Uh, it's gonna serve educators and classified staff uh, for several school districts around the area. 
Um, it's primarily uh, studios and one bedrooms with a couple of uh, two bedrooms in there. Overall, the building is pretty large. It's uh, 78, it's only four stories, but it's 78,000 square feet. Um, we're gonna have one level of type one uh, at the ground floor construction building type, and then um, three levels of type five wood framed. And the um, interesting thing about this project is in addition to being an all electric building, um, we are going to do this through modular delivery um, with uh, factory OS. So that has presented a number of really uh, interesting challenges. I don't think that that in any way sidelines our, our all electric goals, um, but uh, but it, it's, it's also been a very um, uh, interesting process to kind of work through in terms of um, uh, making this work. So overall, I just wanted to share a couple of things. Um, you know, we've been trying very hard to kind of um, to, to, to work with the ethos. And one really interesting thing in particular is that Santa Clara County recently just passed a very, very um, aspirational reach code, which I'll get into a little bit more later. But we've, from the start, we've intended for this building to be all electric, no gas, um, including the water heating. And because of the modular delivery, um, you know, each individual unit, uh, it, you know, wants to be sort of its own self-contained element. And so we started with a very decentralized approach for this project. So all of the building systems are decentralized. The heating and cooling for the units um, will be through these eFOCA uh, HPAC units. Um, uh, each uh, common area or, or living, living um, kitchen co common area will have its own unit. And then each bedroom will have its own unit as well, just to provide the heating and cooling. And so there's just some control within the unit. The hot water, um, as we mentioned, is all um, uh, decentralized as well. And I, I know Pam's gonna get into that in a little bit more detail, but we're on Sean's recommendation using these uh, prestige, Rheem prestige heat pump water heaters in every unit. Um, and the nice thing about all of, all of these systems and this decentralized approach is that it really just reduces the rooftop equipment overall. And we've been able to kind of maximize our PV yield We've had to balance a lot of things with the design of this and and you know our, our intention is always to provide as much um, renewable energy generation as possible but there are other things that we bump into like fire requirements and um, uh, you know and we have all, uh, other uh, other sort of uh, roof access hatches and things that we're going to have to coordinate so it it shrunk our overall PV yield and I'm not remembering off the top of my head what what it is but um, we really we're trying to to generate as much electricity as possible now I mentioned um, the reach code and one of the big things about the Santa Clara County reach code that actually just went into it was just passed by the Board of Supervisors at the end of 2021 and will go into effect on Valentine's Day in just a couple of weeks. Um, but what Santa Clara County um, stipulated was that we needed to provide, um, we needed to be 100% EV ready. Um, well, and we needed to do it with a proportion um, so that the first 20 units plus the additional 25% um, could be uh, level two charging and then the remainder could be level one. And um, with 110 units, and we've got 112 parking spaces, um, that has the potential to be a lot of electric load. And we have a very, despite um, the you know the generous land commitment from the from Santa Clara County, we still have a very tight site constraint. And so um, what we needed to do in order to you know plan for that. <laughs> Um, is you know figure out how much um, uh, electrical load we needed and how many transformers we needed. So in the end, we needed two transformers. So it did increase the the, um, the number of transformers that we were going to have to provide on site. But the benefit is um, you know Santa Clara County is allowing an automatic load management system um, to balance the load at a rate of 1.4 kilowatts per hour. Uh, I think there are other jurisdictions playing around with different um, with different thresholds, but 1.4 was actually um, very helpful to us. And so we'll be We'll be, um, I think the other challenge with this that I, I didn't mention is that we're providing the, um, the parking through uh, mechanical parking stackers, which also takes an additional electrical load. And so we really had to very carefully titrate um, and figure out what our overall load was, figure out where those transformers were gonna go, figure out how we're gonna provide that electric vehicle infrastructure um, with our parking stackers and then add the automatic load management system on top of this. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share some of the behind the scenes 
uh, discussions and conversations and coordination items that we have to balance in order to make some of these um, new reach codes work and to service um, in, and you know, support the residents who are gonna be living here. So um, I think with the automatic load management system, as you can kind of, so you can see here what the stackers kind of look like and how they mount these posts to provide that the electric vehicle charging. Um, with the conventional charging, and you just, if you just allow every car to charge up at the rate that they normally want to, you can have these peaks and valleys. And so sometimes you're not using all the load that you, um, you, you, you have, and sometimes you're overloading it. And what we don't want to do is do that overloading. So the automatic load management systems or the adaptive charging is really what helps to kind of balance out the, the load needed to, um, to charge all of the vehicles that are going to be in, in this garage. And so that, that's a huge help, both from a sizing standpoint and from a, 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 a grid draw perspective. And so we're kind of working through all these issues right now in construction documentation, um, and hopefully we'll be permitting and starting construction later this year. Um, as I've mentioned, sort of the infrastructure implications, um, the load calcs that we ended up doing um, did suggest that we needed an additional transformer, uh, one for the house loads and one for um, house loads for the apartments and one for the, um, the common loads. And, you know, these are not these are not beautiful objects. <laughs> so, uh, you know, for those who are kind of um, working through uh, issues, you know, this is one of the first things that um, architects, designers need, and, uh, you know, energy <laughs> to kind of solve right off the bat. And for us, this is actually coming in halfway <laughs> through. Um, so definitely uh, know what your jurisdiction needs, um, you know, from a, from, a, from a reach code perspective and, and, and you know, integrate that into site planning as soon as possible because it, it can present some fairly significant challenges down the road. But that's all part of preparing for our EV future. And I will, with that, just kind of let Pam take it away. Thanks, Elaine. And uh, thanks, Redwood Energy, for uh, inviting us. Um, I'm super delighted to be talking about uh, Vitalia Apartments today. Uh, today is actually a very a milestone day for this development. Um, we're close, uh, funding is closing today. The construction trailer is gonna be delivered later today as well. We received our building permit earlier this week, um, making it through the San Jose Fire Department, which I'll get into a bit later. It's uh, quite a feat. Um, and we're can, uh, finalizing our conform set uh, of the construction documents later today. So um, give me a moment to be very grateful uh, for this team. I wanna thank um, you know, David Gregory and Fred Pollack and the consultant team, uh, including Redwood Energy to get us to this point. It's super exciting for us. Okay, uh, Elaine, you can move us to the next slide. Um, so it, uh, Vitalia Apartments, or we call it Bascom, is on, in the Cambria neighborhood of San Jose. It's um, 79 units of affordable housing. 39 of them are permanent supportive, meaning uh, formerly homeless or very low income. The unit sizes vary from uh, 46 studios, uh, a good number of ones and twos, and five three bedrooms. Uh, two of those are manager's units. The construction is one level of below grade parking that's type one with five levels of type 3A above. And that's a pretty typical mid-rise um, development uh, size for BMWP projects. Um, and again, we're working with Redwood Energy and a lot of in a, a host of uh, consultants, not all of them are, are here. Um, so I'm going to summarize, um, you know, what our client working with affirmed housing, um, they really have some uh, sustainability integrated into who they are. And so as we start talking about these all electric systems with them, you know, they've balanced the efficiency, the maintenance, ten tenant comfort and, and financial feasibility. And this is kind of where we landed on, the, on this project. Um, the heating and cooling, we're using the Afocas that Elaine spoke about. And here we're doing the same where we have one in, in every living room and bedroom. Uh, no transfer fans um, in this development. The uh, fresh 
uh, air is a supply fans with MERV 13 filters, and we're using um, kind of the Panasonic Whisper Green uh, exhaust in the bathrooms, continuously ventilating with, on humidistats. One thing that's a little different about this development is our lobbies and corridors are unconditioned. They're kind of exterior, indoor, outdoor spaces, um, which is really nice to um, the lobby opens up into the courtyard, um, kind of becoming the heart of the development, and um, and it re reduces the amount of mechanical systems needed. So, uh, as Elaine mentioned, we're also doing a decentralized hot water system here, and um, a couple of the factors that we talked about with the firm was um, that you know it the individual hot water heaters in each unit um, are, have easier maintenance. Um, there's no recirculation pump necessary. The pipe lengths are shorter because there's one in each unit. Um, the, the electric loads are on the tenant's electric bill, um, which can be offset by PV. Um, and, you know, the kind of Factors that to keep in mind that are different for us is we're having to add this small um, closet. It has a door where it's uh, releasing, you know, cool air. Um, there's also acoustic concern, concerns with that. Um, and it, the one little challenging thing is that it does require, um, you know, annual maintenance uh, filter changes where staff needs to come into the unit. So. Um, so uh, the PV, um, I'm gonna go into that in the next slide a bit more. Um, we landed on 138,000 kWh per year, um, offsetting 50% of the tenant load. So we'll get into that lane if you want to, oh, great. Um, sorry, I have two, two dueling monitors going. Um, so a couple of kind of, lessons learned, things to keep in mind. I, you know, uh, Sean showed some beautiful um, facade mounted PVs. Um, that is not something that we were gonna do in this while a firm was committed to maximizing the PV array um, on the roof and offsetting the, the tenant loads. Um, facade PVs were not something that we um, wanted to address on this project. So. We initially covered the, the roof from parapet to parapet with PV, kind of at looking at this center section where we raised the PV array of seven feet above the roof, allowing the fire um, personnel to walk underneath it. It also allows for the outrigger um, exterior building maintenance equipment to happen underneath the um, photovoltaic array. And um, that was great. And then we went through and got kind of went through entitlement, got everybody to sign off on that, and then went through plan check during the building permit process and the fire department changed their requirements on us a little bit. Um, and this is not the only thing, uh, the PV panels were not the only thing affected, but um, so uh, they, the section to the right kind of shows what they decided were, were the clearances we needed. They wanted the um, personnel to be walking under an access aisle that was clear to the, to the sky. So that pushed our PV panels five feet from the perimeter and reduced our array size there. So um, uh, a bit unfortunate, um, but uh, we're, we were able to use more efficient panels. So we have been able to gain some of that um, output back. A couple of other things to keep in mind are just when you do raise the PV arrays, uh, fire sprinklers are, are required in many jurisdictions. Um, and then, but it does allow, you know, for mechanical and plumbing to be underneath them. Okay, kind of moving on. Um, so while we've been talking about uh, operational carbon, um, you know, we'd like to talk a little bit about embodied carbon too, as uh, Sean mentioned earlier. 
Ed Masaria, Masaria told us, you know, at the Carbon Positive Conference two years ago that embodying carbon is really what we need to be addressing in the next 10 years. So we're starting to use Tally, which is a plug-in to our Revit um, energy uh, design software that shows the global warming potential of um, all of our materials. And, you know, as we know, uh, you know, the superstructure, the concrete, the steel, the aluminum are the, you know, the big, the big ticket items. Um, but you can see with the purple there that, you know, finishes and other materials really, you know, impact as well. So we're, um, starting to integrate uh, tally into the beginning of our design process so it can really help um, inform our design and start looking at CLT and other structural methods that Sean mentioned earlier um, to reduce the carbon. On this development, we are using Carbon Cure, which Sean mentioned as well, um, to uh, inject recycled CO2 into the concrete. So. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Laura, who's going to talk uh, about, uh, you know, how we can really uh, reduce carbon by reusing our existing building stock. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Mother Barnard House in Eureka uh, in Redwood Energy's neck of the woods. And this falls a little bit outside the norm, but we wanted to make sure to cover sort of the the adaptive reuse um, projects and the renovations that we embark on um, in the Bay Area and beyond. Um, and this is actually a project that is converting two existing 1950s motel buildings, one of which you can see in the back there, and adding a new construction shown in color um, that includes common areas and an additional six units. And so the development is a total of three buildings. And Elaine, you can go to the summary there. Um, so this is, our client is Providence Supportive Housing. They're actually a housing uh, portion of the larger healthcare provider. And so there is a, a recuperative um, part of the program here for people coming out of homelessness and into permanent supportive housing. We have mostly studios on this project, tiny motel rooms that we are converting into permanent housing. Um, and adding cooking facilities for um, to be able to do that. Um, so there's two, the two two-story existing buildings, um, the one new, and then our team is about half local to Eureka um, and half West Coast, San Francisco and Seattle. So here's the site. Um, and actually I, I was following the parking discussion in the chat kind of interesting, Eureka doesn't um, require uh, parking for units under 500 square feet. Um, and so that's something that was not actually an issue here. And, you know, every project we have fights back on parking essentially um, through parking studies, through state density bonus reductions. So it is a, a constant battle that we're engaged in and assisting our clients on. So those were some great questions. Um, so in Eureka here, thankfully, we get to use pretty much our whole site. Um, and you can see on the top there, the existing buildings and the parking area. We're demolishing the lobby, um, which is the small wing on the Northeast, and we're filling it in. Now, every square foot of space here is being used for um, landscaped and community areas. It's really pretty amazing what our landscape has been able to fit in here um, as far as usable and green space. Um, and the, the new building, which is all electric, is actually utilizing the existing 600 amp service that serves the whole site. So we are um, we're keeping the existing transformer working within those service limits um, and pushing it almost as far as it can go um, to provide a new building. There's going to be PV on all three buildings to serve a common meter, so it's anticipated to offset 50% of the total load. I'll go to the next one, Elaine. So the new building um, has many of the same strategies we talked about, except the domestic hot water is actually a central ream uh, heat pump water heater. There's two of them to serve this space. 
And I would say, I don't know of those 13 projects, there are definitely several that are doing um, common heat pump hot water heaters, others that are doing decentralized. So that's almost split down the middle, um, depending on the project needs. Um, and then each unit is getting um, one of the FOCA HPACs. Um, we have multi-split ducted heat pumps in the common areas and balanced ventilation with MERV 13 filters. We also added an elevator here. One of the goals of the project was to increase accessibility to all of the units. So there's a bridge between the existing motel and the new building. And so that load um, was important to take into consideration when um, using the existing service. Um, in the existing buildings, we have common laundry in 43 tiny motel units, and all the renovated units, of which there's just a handful, are getting the same, you know, um, supply fan and Epica um, HPAC. Um, all of the units are, are becoming homes rather than um, transitory stay. So they're getting kitchenettes that include a mini fridge and microwave, and we had to be mindful of how to utilize the existing circuits in the units and not increase capacity. Um, but we were able to do that in working with the city. And then the common laundry is converting from gas to electric. The existing gas water heaters remain. That's the single um, source of gas in the existing buildings. And this is something that, you know, Sean and I are still working on. So we'll see where this ends up. But right now, um, the gases to remain, you'll see they're in these sort of cramped and unventilated spaces. Um, and just a couple of the challenges are, you know, working within that existing th service threshold. There's a bit of a threat of exceeding that. So it takes some committed and creative engineering um, to make that work. And then, you know, ultimately replacing a working system is perceived as an additional cost um, for now. But our, a lot of our clients hold um, their, their projects, you know, indefinitely, uh, you know, 50 years or beyond. And so we're also helping the client look towards the future and what this property, uh, how it's going to be managed in the future. And go ahead, Elaine. And then just a note on building reuse in general. Um, the, the two photographs are, are built and incorporate some gas. The two um, black and white are in the hopper and will be all electric. But this is just a small sample of the kind of conversions that we're working on. So office buildings to housing, a teacher's college, we're working on a hospital campus elsewhere. Another motel uh, in the lower right where we're adding a story and an irrigation pump building to community space. So it really kind of, we, we get all kinds of uses that we are looking at converting to housing and community space or mixed use. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity and creativity there um, to be explored. And looking forward, so there's just a couple, I know we have a minute. Um, there's just a couple uh, projects right now that are in the works that we're very excited about and you know, looking at how we can push our practice forward. So 180 Jones on the right is, is um, involved in the living building challenge uh, on the materials pedal and in-house we're working on you know, identifying the red list and using that to inform product selection. And so that's, um, that's a pretty involved effort that we hope to use for other projects moving forward. As Pam mentioned, uh, Vitalia Apartments use Tally. We want to use that all over the place. So we're trying to integrate that into our practice as just a standard um, way that we do design. And then we're also involved in the CEC Epic Challenge with the Balboa Reservoir Project on the lower left, which is an urban design project where we're doing pursuing one of the buildings. Um, and then there are a few of us that are passive house consultants on staff, and we're very excited about finding a multifamily opportunity. So that is, that's what we could fit in our 30 minutes, and we're really happy to, to share some of our work with you all. That was fantastic. 
This is a beautiful array of projects, really well done. You can see there's like a ton of questions over in the chat. I hope that if you don't mind hanging out there for a couple minutes and trying to inform people, a lot of questions about the canopy solar array, and of course, electric vehicle management and all the hot button topics you brought up in advanced you know, multifamily electrification. Yes, way to go. Okay, so to stay on time here, I am going to transition now uh, over to Mark Kressowick.